You know, recently, live from Lincoln Center, broadcast Good Night Alice, a concert celebrating Alice Tully Hall before it closed for major renovations. This concert was reminiscent of the one which opened the hall 35 years ago. We thought it would be interesting to look at this New York City institution from two people who know it well. Alice Tully Hall is, is a great place to work simply because it gives us an opportunity to work on so many different kinds of presentations. My father brought me into this business. He literally brought me into this building in 1969 as the paint was drying. We knew that this place was going to be something special. Live from New York City, a very special musical event. Juilliard comes to Lincoln Center. We are witnessing today an exciting and important event, a joyous event in the world of the American mind and spirit. The opening here at Lincoln Center of the new Juilliard School of Music. I remember he called us at the house right before the broadcast. There was a CBS broadcast, I think it was a dedication of Juilliard. And he was very much excited about what was going to happen in the future of this hall. And it was shortly thereafter in 1970 that I started to work here also. I met my wife in this building. My children have been in this building. There's a sense of continuity and relationships that go above and beyond what I think a, a traditional job description would uh, talk about. Many people have experienced great performances at Alice Tully Hall, but few know anything about the woman who built it. Robert White is a singer who knew the benefactor of this great institution. She was a dear, dear friend of mine. When I'm in Alice Tully Hall, I feel her presence. I feel her love. I feel the um, passion that she had for the hall's being. Alice was a singer. She studied in Paris for many years. She was a person that music meant everything to her. She was born not only to wealth and to great wealth, but great intelligence and great discernment and great belief in honesty between people. And she had a wonderful, fine moral strength and character without being a holier than thou or chiding other people to live a certain way. That wasn't Alice. She was very much into helping people on that kind of good-hearted nurse level and an ambulance driver, and that was in the Second World War. She had her pilot's license, and I think part of it was being part of a civilian patrol group that would watch out for any U-boats that might be arriving off the Long Island shore a while. But Alice helped so many people in so many ways. Just I'm just talking about the music field. I mean, young artists could go to Alice and find a way to perhaps finance the purchase of a new bow for their violin or a, a new bassoon. I, I know of several cases like that. Or uh, uh, a series of lessons or a trip to Europe for a singer to sing for uh, some maestro or maestros in those days. And um, she would help people to pay their rent and never talk about it for young artists. She was, she was really a, uh, a d d fairy godmother to so many people. Alice is one of the truly dearest friends of my whole lifetime. She was a very, if you want to use a term, a regular gal in so many ways. The most wonderful thing was, you know, around six o'clock, I'd have been finished with my work at home and I'd wonder what I'm going to do. Well, I'd put up a pot of water, maybe make a little pasta or something, and the phone could ring. Hello, dear, it's Al Alice, how are you? Bobby, dear, I wondered what you might be doing for dinner. And I had the choice, and I'd say either, well, Alice, I'm just making a little bite. Would you like to come over? I'd love to. And lo and behold, in 40 minutes or so, the chauffeur would bring her to my door up in West End Avenue. He'd wait for four hours while she came upstairs, and I prepared the dinner, and she'd always arrive, God love her, with two, not one, but two bottles of Moet and Chandon Brut Imperial, and she'd put all of that force into the delivery of what she had in the bag, and it was ice cold. And um, I hesitate to say this, but we kind of finished both those bottles in the course of the four hours. Alice's... Uh, uh, lover, her, her, her devoted friend, uh, Edward Grafer, whom I knew 
that was early on because Edward died literally the the week of the opening of Alice Tully Hall. He died in, I think, Switzerland with Alice. There was some kind of food poisoning or what, but uh, she had to come back shattered to the opening of the hall. It was, it was a very, very bittersweet and difficult time for her. Towards the end, the fact that she took her last transatlantic flight in 1991, really to come over to hear me sing in Carmen at the uh, Monte Carlo Opera. And she was in a wheelchair by then, and I knew that this had to be the last big trip. Um, you know, Alice was on in years, and sure enough, that same year is when she had her, her stroke. That was December, I think, of 91. Last night at the hall, for me, it was, it was surprisingly emotional. I didn't expect it to be such. But once I realized, I mean, at least it was not the closing forever of the hall. And as each person came up and did their thing and performed, when the screen came down and all of a sudden Alice's face was on that screen, I just, I jumped up and I, 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 I know I let out a sigh of ah, and it hit me all of a sudden that the hall was still here, I was there, the people were there, but Alice wasn't. And so although the hall would come back, I knew that Alice wouldn't. And I really, really, I was very um, moved. Unlike other theaters on the campus that have a lot of windows, Tully Hall is submerged underground. In 18 months, the music will return to a new, improved, and more open Alice Tully Hall. But the corner of 65th and Broadway will never be the same.